Ah, welcome back. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, class and inequality. A lot of this has to deal with uh, the economic situation of, of what's going on. So how are people uh, being treated differently because of their uh, economic status, uh, uh, their, their racial status, you know, all of these different things, how much money they make, how much money they have in reserve, you know, how is that going to impact uh, their livelihoods? What makes people essential workers, right? Um, so if we look at how people are affected through their economic status, there's some obvious things. You know, if you're more wealthy, if you have the, the, the funds to do so, sheltering in place is easier to do, right? If, if you're forced um, out of work, uh, if you have savings, you can survive a little bit better, right? Um, you know, and, and you can provide yourself with uh, better opportunities, better access to health care. Um, you're probably going to live in a, in a nicer community with nicer hospitals. Versus if you're poor, right, having access to those resources uh, becomes more and more desperate, um, especially if, you, uh, if you're not working, if you got laid off, if you, um, you know, access to, to, to jobs or to uh, hours at work have been uh, diminished. What happens then? And, and that's a really important question to ask, you know, and we've seen... Uh, millions, uh, millions and millions of people uh, go on unemployment and uh, oftentimes in dire need of help. And that help um, oftentimes comes in the way of family, um, but also uh, in, from, uh, uh, from federal or state resources. Um, and how do those states, you know, how do different countries deal with those issues? Um, in the United States, you know, there were two, uh, two checks that were sent out to, uh, uh, to folks to help them, you know, survive what was going on. Other countries like Canada and lots of places in Europe, they were like, oh, yeah, no, every, every month everybody gets, gets a check to, to help support. So how do different countries deal with those sort of economic uh, crises? Um, who gets access to the vaccine first, right? You know, we, uh, we pretty much went for the folks that needed it more, right? Uh, older folks that, uh, that, might be, uh, um, that might be compromised, that have comorbidities, uh, um, folks that might have uh, uh, bigger issues if they get sick, right? Uh, and then it gets, you know, then it gets filtered down through other folks, uh, first responders, um, uh, teachers and students, uh, and then, you know, essential workers were supposed to be in there, and then they kind of got pushed to the back as things sort of developed, and now everybody has access to it. Um, and that's, you know, it's interesting to see how things have sort of developed um, and, and a lot of that can come down to, uh, again, access, right? Uh, who, which, which areas are going to get more access uh, to the vaccine? Um, you know, uh, different states are going to have different responses um, by how they get access. Um, so, you know, as we, as we look at the vaccine rollout, you know, how is it being impacted? How are we dealing with it? Um, how do we look at the economy versus like the stock market? Uh, because the two are not, uh, they're not the same, right? A stock market is usually accessed by only, you know, about 10 to 20 percent of Americans um, on, in, in, a, in a realistically uh, uh, usable way, right? 
eighty percent of Americans they for the most part they might have some stocks tied into their retirement, but for the most part they really have very little access to uh, to having stocks and so the stock market really hasn't been impacted all that much um, but the economy on the other hand has drastically been hit uh, hit by uh, by what's been going on and this has to has to do with how people have lost their jobs, been unable to make payments on their uh, on their apartments, on their houses, uh, be able to buy food, be able to buy uh, essentials, right? And then what happens when the moratorium on evictions uh, is lifted, right? How many uh, thousands and possibly millions of people might be kicked out of their uh, their homes because they you know, fell behind on paying rent. Um, and how do we deal with that as a society? Um, what are going to be the, the short-term and long-term effects? Right? How are we going to look at what's going to happen in the next, uh, next couple of months, to the next year, to the next five years? And then how much of an impact do we think we're going to see in 10 or 20 years? Um, because in, in some very realistic ways, there are going to be some pretty serious long-term impacts uh, from COVID. Um, and a lot of that stuff might not be seen yet, right? Uh, not only because of uh, the, the hit that a lot of families are going to take economically, you know, to be able to build up those resources again, um, but how we actually work, right? We all of a sudden discovered that we can... Uh, a lot of folks can work from home. You know, the, the, the brick and mortar style workplace um, isn't as mandatory as it once used to be. So that's going to have uh, a big impact on, on, on the future of, uh, uh, of our society. If we look at uh, uh, how companies adapted to, uh, like, Amazon, right? Amazon went gangbusters. Right? They made a ton of money because people were like, instead of going to their local um, supermarket or uh, uh, convenience store or uh, like a Target or, uh, you know, someplace like that, they, they just went online and bought it and it just got dropped off at their own house. They didn't have to risk going out. Uh, so how is that going to impact stores, and how do how does the online economy going to impact folks? Um, and again, that also comes down to access, right? If you don't have internet, if you don't have a cell phone, um, you know, do you have to uh, venture out into uh, a more dangerous situation uh, where you might get sick, or do you have to work in a place where um, you know, you're going to be more susceptible to getting infected. And, and those kind of things can continually impact communities over and over again. Um, and that's where a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, the continuation of these diseases are going to be uh, uh, kept because it's going to have access to people. Um, what kind of help has been created uh, and what was in place and how has it been impacted? So, you know, when we look at disaster relief, um, you know, how did different communities, different cultures react to the situation, right? What, what kind of impact was there? And, you know, if we look at the federal government, yeah, in, in the United States, it was not a good reaction. You know, a lot of states did better and some states did worse. Um, depending on, on how things were sort of organized and set up. Um, if we look at sort of like uh, uh, resources uh, and how they were drained through rational or irrational fear. And, you know, those resources can be uh, uh, lots of different consumables. You know, for instance, uh, the, the great uh, toilet paper um, uh, issue that we had at, at the beginning of the uh, uh, the pandemic where, you know, toilet paper 
was hard to get. I mean, it was it was a commodity. You know, um, you you had to work hard and and really find out when your local supermarket was going to be back in stock with toilet paper. And you had convenience stores that were selling them by the roll. You know. Um, and it was just wild. It was just wild to see how certain resources uh, disappeared quickly um, and other resources were not, right? And how quickly those resources would be impacted. One of the things that we're starting to see as fallout is the construction, right? We're seeing um, a lot of construction materials uh, uh, going skyrocket as far as price. I think lumber is like three times the price of what it was uh, a year ago. And that has an impact on uh, the, the building of new homes, right? When you've got a 30% increase in materials or just a lack of materials to buy in the first place, it's slowing down production. Um, and that limits resources. And that also can artificially uh, jack the prices of home ownership uh, to the point where if we're talking about like Denver, you know, um, buying a home in the Denver metro area is becoming insane, where houses have literally uh, increased in value by like 50% um, from what they were just a couple years ago. Uh, and it's because the demand. People, you know, uh, are living their, their pandemic lives. They're not thinking about selling. It might be too expensive to sell. Um, it might be, uh, 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 it's not safe to, to sell because trying to move, trying to find a new place, you know, uh, opens up the ability to, uh, to get sick. So people are sheltering in place. Um, but people that are moving, that, that have to move for a job or for whatever reason, are finding that, you know, the, the, the pricing of, of housing, of, of finding apartments and stuff like that is insanely difficult and, and way, way more expensive than, than a lot of people would have expected. Um, so what does that do to uh, families that are dealing with, um, you know, living in low income? Right? Are their prices? Are their their uh, their rents? Are they going to go up? Um, you know what happens when uh, again that that uh, foreclosure moratorium uh, and the uh, uh, the eviction moratoriums are are lifted? You know where are those folks going to go, and and how can they afford uh, the their their next home? And what's that going to do to the homeless population, which has been skyrocketing? Uh, all around the country, all around the world. So we see all of these different things impacting one after another after another. And we, you know, we sometimes look at poverty um, and, and homelessness, but we don't necessarily connect it to uh, the lack of resources like lumber, right? And the cost of building new homes uh, and people moving and being able to sell a starter home that was cheap and buying a more expensive home so that another family could buy that starter home. But that starter home now costs twice as much as it used to. All of these things uh, can be impacted um, by this. And, you know, uh, especially when we're talking about younger generations, um, one of the things that we've seen an uptick in is, is the, the, like, van life, you know, um, people moving into vans. I mean, just take a look at what happened at the Oscars. You know, you got the, uh, the number one movie in the country is Nomadland. You know, it's the story of about a woman who moves into her van and then, you know, looks for work and, and travels around and seeing those communities. And it's, it's a growing community, um, you know, because it, it, it does. It, it's a reaction of, of what's happening within our own economy. So, you know, those kinds of things are really important to understand what's going on with resources and, and how it has a big impact on, on communities. Um, 
you know, and then again, how does this impact the class classes themselves, right? Is there a bigger gap now between the upper class and the, the middle and lower class? You know, uh, a lot of the upper class, they're making a lot of money. Stock market's doing well, right? Middle and lower class, not so much. So we might be seeing a bigger gap. You know, how do we see that? How do we uh, come to understand the reasons why? Sexuality. Sexuality, in this case, um, I think is really interesting to take a look at. How people are uh, dealing with um, ideas of, of sex. Is it, how are things being affected by like isolation, right? Uh, what about online dating? Um, how are people meeting? How are people engaging in romance? Uh, what about, um, you know, because, uh, uh, what about situations of like sexual abuse or harassment, right? Um, when we have higher amounts of, of stress, uh, in society based on economic issues or racial issues, we might see an increase in, uh, sexual abuse, um, or in domestic violence, uh, because of those added stressors, right? So what are we, what are we going to look for? You know, what kind of impacts are we going to see? Um, let's see. Uh, what about what's going to happen after the pandemic ends, right? Again, what are the short-term and long-term effects of, of living in a pandemic and how is that going to impact um, relationships, population growth, uh, population shifts, um, how are all of those things going to be impacted by um, uh, relationships and, and people having kids? Is there going to be a shortage of kids, right? Um, what about marriages and divorces? Uh, how is the, the wedding industry going to be impacted? Um, all of these different things are going to be, uh, we, we could take a look at and see how uh, we've dealt with these things in the past, how things are going to be dealt with in the future. Um, and I think trying to understand, you know, some of the other dynamics, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, we're seeing is uh, uh, how men and women are dealing with uh, jobs uh, in this case, like um, uh, dealing specifically with like uh, gender roles. How are uh, uh, men and women dealing with new responsibilities? As we have, you know, had to shelter in place, uh, and again, a lot of people are working from home now. Um, if, they, if they are working, there's a lot of at-home work. Um, how does that shift the roles within the domestic realm? You know, certainly within the sort of the, the gender ideology that has been a part of you know, uh, American life, you know, we see that women oftentimes deal more with the domestic role. Um, and that is, that is changing. That is being impacted by the coronavirus. Um, but how much so, uh, you know, even though you might have, uh, men who are more traditionally, they, they're the ones that go out to work. Um, and women have a tendency to, to in a lot of situations, uh, stay at home, do child rearing, um, and that kind of stuff. That's sort of the, the, the American legacy. And that has changed a lot within the last uh, 50 years. But it, there's still that aspect of that there. But now we're seeing this new aspect coming in where men are staying at home. Are we seeing those gender roles uh, becoming more equalized. And in some cases we are, and in other cases we aren't. We're still seeing those sort of divisions, even though, um, you know, the, the men might be coming home and, and staying uh, more, uh, they, they might not be picking up as many domestic duties uh, as they once, uh, once had to deal with. So how is that going to be impacted, right? Uh, what are the responsibilities um, for, for various folks to, to be able to, uh, uh, to run their lives. 
Um, you know, and then at the same time as we've been doing this, we've been having lots of other discussions about gender roles and, and gender equality and also uh, like uh, uh, transgender uh, recognition. Um, you know, even talking about what's going on with, uh, uh, with like school sports, you know, and, and how has the pandemic brought this sort of subject up as we've been exploring um, and, and coming to understand a lot more about uh, gender identity, uh, you know, these, these issues have been coming up as far as like gender rights. And so now we've got states that are weighing in on whether or not uh, uh, kids that are transgender, you know, whether or not they're able to compete in sports. Um, which, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's, it's, it's not a big enough issue to even be considering. Um, there are much, much better things that we could, you know, deal with and put our efforts towards. Uh, anyway, um, I think gender I identity is, is important for us to recognize that, uh, you know, as, as communities, as anthropologists, we can recognize that, uh, um, our society is much more complex, much more dynamic, uh, than we had once thought it was. Um, and that the inclusion of everybody is important to, uh, to get a, not only a good idea about the culture that you're working within, but as, as a human species and, you know, dealing with empathy and dealing with, um, just how would I want to be treated, you know, in any given situation, you know? Uh, would I want to be treated with scorn or would I want to be treated with compassion? That might have been a soapbox moment. Anyway, um, back to, to, to gender roles, you know, uh, how, are, uh, how are we dealing with kids? Right? How are we dealing with teaching kids? You know, what roles are families falling into? Um, and, and how are we dealing with these issues? You know, we've seen that a, a disproportionate amount of women have quit their jobs um, to come back and uh, take care of their kids because their kids can't go to school. And a lot of schools were shut down. So what happens to those kids? Um, and, and women that might still have had a place of work to go to um, had to leave and, and take care of their kids. And it was disproportionately women over men. Uh, again, following some of these legacy uh, uh, gender ideologies that, uh, that we've been dealing with. Um, and so what kind of a economic impact does that also have? You know, uh, not only with education, but with uh, money coming into uh, into the family. Um, dealing with wage gaps, these are all still things that are impacted that, you know, were pre-pandemic, but how are they being uh, changed to or adapted to or, or exacerbated by the pandemic, right? And then are we going to see changes to uh, uh, to gender identity? I think one of the interesting things that, that we can kind of contemplate, and this will go into, um, you know, a little bit when we talk about art, um, is, is media and the fact that uh, we are being exposed to all kinds of different uh, shows and experiences and music, um, giving more... Uh, more access to uh, uh, gender identity, gender fluidity, um, and how people are learning more about these, these issues. And especially when they have more time, like being at home or they're unemployed, you know, one of the things that people do a lot is, you know, if they've got access to it, they'll watch YouTube or they'll, you know, watch more TV. And guess what happens? People learn more about what's going on out there. So we might see some changes uh, as far as um, 
you know, sort of gender, uh, gender related issues. Uh, and this will also become um, even more important, you know, when we're dealing with politics uh, and, and how different uh, political ideologies are going to deal with those issues. And again, those, those ideologies politically are oftentimes associated uh, with similar religious ideologies as well. Um, art and media, right? And, and this, this is something that has uh, certainly changed uh, a, a lot in, in different ways. You know, we've seen a, a, a huge increase in the use of, of not only social media, uh, but for entertainment as well. Like, you know, um, uh, Netflix and uh, YouTube and, and, and Disney and all these different companies have, you know, fought to provide a lot of content, even though content wasn't necessarily being created, right? Um, and I think that's one of the interesting things about, like, YouTube and why it's seen a huge uptick is that people have more time and they're trying to figure out different ways of uh, uh, even making a living using YouTube. I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of, of YouTube is that it's, I think it's a very democratizing um, platform uh, because as, as people use it, they create content um, and then it can be shared um, to thousands if not millions of people. Uh, can can see what you have put together, what you have done and experienced and, and all of this stuff. So, you know, um, it gives a lot of people voice. And I think that's a really cool thing about YouTube is that it, it can do that. At the same time, it gives people voice and sometimes that voice isn't always great and people can share um, disparaging things as well. So you have to kind of uh, deal with both um, as you're dealing with these issues. Um, what about, you know, the creation of art? Are people being more artistic? You know, if they've got more time on their hands, uh, are they engaging in, in artistic projects? What about stress? You know, uh, a lot of, lot of people aren't doing a lot of that stuff, even though they say, say they want to, but because of the, the stress of the pandemic that, you know, they're not being as productive. You know, they're just dealing with the moment. Um, how, how are we gonna deal with uh, the pandemic uh, through art? Um, and how are we gonna deal with it in the future? Um, how, how are we going to be informed in the future of, uh, uh, of how the pandemic went? You know, what did we learn? What did we experience? You know, all of these different things are going to be expressed through different mediums, you know, whether it's social media or, uh, uh, multimedia platforms or it's, you know, the, the big corporations and the, the Netflixes and all of those, you know, how are they going to adapt to, uh, the, the new ideas, new concepts, new practices of, of art and media. Um, and, and we've certainly seen some issues with social platforms, with, with like news. You know, uh, if you take a look at like Facebook and you look at how Facebook has dealt with uh, the pandemic, whether, you know, dealing with uh, vaccine information, dealing with uh, people that are claiming that the, the, uh, the pandemic is manufactured, you know, all of these different things, you know, what has been the response? Because it's, you know, while we might criticize how different companies, you know, and certainly Facebook is, is kind of at the forefront of this, how they've dealt with the pandemic, they've never had to deal with this kind of thing before. And so, where are they finding sort of that, that medium space where they can, you know, sort of deal with multiple sides uh, of, of information and, and sharing, you know? And then how do you, uh, at the same time, um, uh, say that, you know, this information is blatantly false, right? 
um, how do you deal with that sort of censure? You know, um, and is it, are we dealing with First Amendment right issues, right, right to free speech, um, even if it's uh, uh, very false, right, if it's false information, um, you know, based on, a, on, a, on the scientific knowledge? How do you deal with that? And so, you know, this could be sort of the, the, the groundbreaking um, uh, moment for a lot of social media to kind of figure out where they're going to land when it comes to uh, dealing with misinformation, right? Not just shared information, but uh, misinformation either shared intentionally or unintentionally, right? And, and how do you deal with that stuff? Um, and then what happens to our public spaces, right? Uh, are we just going to go back to normal and visiting art galleries and, and museums and, uh, and stuff like that when we're talking about, you know, more traditional style of art? Um, or are those places going to be uh, less common, right? Uh, again, because they're public spaces. And what kind of fallout is there going to be from the pandemic? Um, and then also, you know, like musicians, you know, how are musicians going to survive? I've, I have some friends that are professional musicians and, you know, how they have, uh, uh, either thrived or, uh, uh, dealt with the, the repercussions of not having access to traditional venues, right? Um, these are all big questions. How do you deal with this kind of stuff? So then we have to figure out how do we put it all together, right? This holistic approach. Um, and we have to kind of take all of these things together. You know, how is race going to impact gender and sexuality? Um, how is uh, 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 inequality and, and social justice, how are those going to be impacted? Um, how is language going to impact all of it, right? We take all of these various things together and we start putting together this, this story. And it can be a very, very broad story um, that, we're, that we're seeing. And we've, we've seen a lot of this in the news. We've seen people talk about different things uh, going on, but oftentimes it's from a specific angle, right? And what we're trying to do as anthropologists is to take all of it into one, uh, one great big pile, one great big puzzle, and start putting the pieces together and creating some sort of, um, you know, depiction of, of the real story, of, of the, the total and complete story. I think the interesting thing about anthropology, though, is that, you know, um, while we try and do this holistic approach, that holistic approach is also constantly changing, um, especially when we're given new information, when we're given different changes in culture, right? We see something happening over here and that impacts us in a different way, that impacts the culture, we gain new information. And that changes the puzzle, right? And initially we might have this piece, it's a thousand piece puzzle, it's really complex, it's very colorful, right? Really a lot of fun to put together. Then all of a sudden, we get more puzzle pieces. And those puzzle pieces, you know, all of a sudden they, they fit the same hole, but it's a different color, it's a different piece. And it fits differently, right? It changes the picture. Um, and then sometimes it grows the puzzle. Right? It becomes more complex. We get more pieces to add in, and it's constantly changing. Right? We have this, this puzzle, and it's modifying itself. And our job as anthropologists is to you know, continually work on that puzzle, to continually get a look at that picture and see what it looks like, and then see what it changes to. And then to imagine what it looked like years before so that we can get this understanding of, of progression, right? Uh, and 
it gives us a better understanding of how that culture has uh, modified itself. And so, you know, each time we finish that aspect of that, that picture, you know, we write an ethnography, right? We talk about the culture, we write it down, and that becomes that, we, basically it's like a snapshot of that puzzle at that moment. And then we, you know, we're given more pieces to that puzzle and we fill in new holes and we, you know, add to it. And then we take another snapshot and that's another eth 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 ethnography. And now we've got... Uh, multiple things to compare on and then we can use those two or three or four ethnographies that we continually make and we can make predictors of what that picture might look like in the future based on this progression. So I think anthropology it's it's always interesting it's always uh, giving us new information a new understanding of looking at uh, at people at culture at life and uh, uh, it's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun, and it benefits everybody. You know, uh, you know, even if you don't go into anthropology, which you know, if you're up in the air about what you want to do with your life, I highly recommend it. I mean, I'm I might be biased uh, because I'm an anthropologist, but uh, I recommend that you uh, at least take a look at it. Um, but it can help you in any job in any situation in life. If you can understand people and why they do the things that they do, you will be better off. You will understand the dynamics of that community, uh, the dynamics of the people that you are living and working with. And if you can do that, you will be in a better situation. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's about it. We, yep, yep, that was it. Um, what I really hope that you guys get out of this is the ability to do critical analysis. You know, that's part of what our papers were about this entire semester, uh, dealing with um, the ability to look at what's going on and to put our own thoughts into it, our understanding our own bias, um, understanding why people might do things, and, and, and be critical about those situations. Be critical of what people tell you. Uh, be critical of um, things that people just take for granted, okay? I think this is more important than anything else. Um, don't follow blindly um, as you're uh, going throughout life, as you're going through, um, you know, all the, the stuff that we are exposed to all the time, the news and the media and, and people talking. That's why you need to do your own research, you know, uh, and, and find reputable, reputable sites for doing that research, you know, and then question that research. Keep questioning. Always question. You know, if there's anything that you can do, question. Never just buy into anything. Um, you know, it's easy to buy into things. It's easy to just accept that this is a reality or this is the truth. Um, but if you're a good scientist, if you, if you want to go into that, if you want to be a good scientist, then you have to question everything all the time. And if you do that, uh, you're going to find out that, you know, it, it, it'll be a struggle, but it'll be eye-opening and it'll be fun, you know, because you'll always be learning something. You'll always be discovering something or someone, and, and that can be the, the greatest part of life is, is to learn those new things and experience people and all that stuff. It's, it's just great. It's why I love anthropology, you know, I, I get to uh, do all kinds of, uh, of, of cool things and see people and get to know them and get to understand their culture. And it helps me understand my own culture that much better. So, yeah, be critical. Uh, explore. Ask questions. Uh, why? Why, why, why? You know, always ask that. You know, it might seem annoying sometimes. It's kind of like, you know, if you have a toddler, you know, why this, why that? 
be that annoying toddler. It's all right. You know, that's what science is. You know, come up with a come up with a guess. See if it works. If it doesn't, that's okay. That's the great thing about science. Science doesn't care if you're wrong. You're just finding out more information. Being wrong is uh, just as important as being right because you're eliminating the process of, of, a, a, of bad information. So, anyway, uh, it's been my pleasure. You know, thanks, thanks for taking this class. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, doing the homework, taking the exams. Uh, the interaction that I've had with you guys has been uh, enjoyable. Uh, I wish there was more and we might get to a point where there will be at some point um, where we can actually sit in the same classroom or you know somewhere and and have some sort of normalcy so uh, I, I hope that comes soon so uh, yeah all right guys good luck uh, good luck on your exams if you have any questions if you have any issues do not hesitate to contact me, um, you know, if you want to just shoot the breeze about something you've got on your mind, you're always welcome to contact me. I, I love the conversation, uh, especially living in an isolated realm now while I film this in my basement. Anyway, okay, have a good one. Uh, be safe, take care of each other, and uh, thanks. Adiós.